unto you, children of God, uh, from our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but his grace and his peace be unto you all. Now, you know what? I thank our God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus the Christ, that in everything, children, you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, as the word transforms you, so that you won't be lacking in any gift as you wait upon the coming of our Lord Jesus the Christ. My friends, welcome to the Master's Touch Masterclass. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. You know, these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God, and I'm going to take you from the very beginning to our eternal beginning in depth, in God's Word, revealing His plan and purpose for your life, how He mapped it out, why He designed it that way, and into who you are in Christ, what power you have, why you have it, and how to operate in it as God designed you to. You won't want to miss any of these classes. However, if you can't make it to the virtual classroom that we're ha having today, then know that these are archived in Spreaker.com and on the website www.themasterstouch.org. And that's all there, excuse me, it's all there for your convenience. God bless you richly as we begin today's lesson. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, just flowing through our lips. We exalt you, we praise you, and we lift up your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and our Savior, our only Son, your only Son, Father, Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation knowledge you're about to impart, for your rhema word and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word in the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Okay, we're still talking about grace, and I want to talk about the main clause of the New Covenant. One of the saddest things that's happening today is that you hardly hear the main clause of the New Covenant being preached. Let's take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 10, and verse 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For this is the covenant that I will make. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Memorize this verse, Hebrews 8.12, because this is the main and happens to be the final clause of the New Covenant. Unfortunately, it seems that what uh, the average, average Christian believes today is actually the complete opposite. They believe that God's not merciful to their sins, and when something goes wrong, they think something like, well, the roosters finally come home to roost. My past sins have caught up with me. All these terrible things are happening to my family and my finances because the sins I have committed. All right? When they have a flat tire, they think that sin is God punishing them. I mean, what sin is God punishing them for? This kind of thinking is really prevalent in the church because Christians don't really believe and understand the, the new covenant, and they don't know what their covenant contains. So the problem with the church today is wrong believing. Now, let me tell you that if you refuse um, to believe what God said about his forgiveness of sins in the new covenant, then you're actually in disobedience. That's right. Jesus def defined this himself for the new covenant for us at the Last Supper when he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, the main clause of the new covenant is the forgiveness of all your sins because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I don't care how many good deeds you've done, how much money you've given to charity, or what leadership position you hold. If you don't believe the main clause of the New Covenant, you're in disobedience. God placed that main clause of the New Covenant as the last clause to show us that it's the final clause that makes everything work. Now, I realize that we went over this last time, but I'm recovering this strategy and this, this uh, ground because the Lord told me to. Now... <laughs> If you don't believe the main and final clause, you are rejecting the New Covenant and negating the finished work of Jesus on the cross. The New Covenant says that God is merciful to all your unrighteousness and has forgotten your sins, plus your lawless deeds. Now, if God says that he has forgotten them, then he truly has forgotten them. Who are we to contradict God? 
Remember, he can't lie. But how can he forget my sins? I mean, I mean, really, how can he forget my sins? Heavens, I mean, I, we, we just can't even begin to think of anything else that he could possibly forgive your sins. But the thing of it is, is uh, it, it's clear that, well, let me give you this, this other scripture here in a second. Um, oh dear, my, I have a, I've been having computer problems and, and uh, so my, my uh, outline keeps disappearing. All right, so let me get back up here where I can find where I left off. Um, well, isn't that terrible? This happens to me all the time. All right. Anyway, as I was saying, how can you believe that he forgets gives all your sins? I mean, how can he forget it? We can't possibly forget it. Well, that's how, because we keep our minds uh, thinking about Jesus and thinking about God as if he were the same as us, and he's not. And, you know, he can forgive us and forget all of our sins. How? Because he's God. And if he said it, that settles it. He's done it. You know that sin you committed years ago? Well, God has forgotten it. Contrary to what you might have been taught, God doesn't keep an itemized account of all your failures. So, you know, there's no big projector screen in heaven to show all your sins from the day you were born to the day that you returned to heaven. All records of your sins have been er eradicated, incinerated, and done away with by the blood of Jesus. When he cried out, it is finished. His blood has removed the sins of your entire life. When God looks at you today, he sees you covered with Jesus' blood and completely righteous. Only the devil, yourself, and the people around you will bring your sins to your remembrance, my friends. So when you're weighted down by the mistakes of your past, run to God and lean on his grace. Why? For he will be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and your lawless deeds. He will remember no more. Now this is the main clause of the new covenant of grace. Well, having established that, then we can just go out and sin all over the place and be forgiven, right? No, not right. I have yet to meet a person who has been born again that desires to sin ever again. I have encountered those who have given up and walked away from God, not because of an evil desire to sin, but because they were sincere and continually failed in their own attempts to keep the laws of the, of the Old Covenant, and they ended up feeling like hypocrites. Now, knowing that you are completely forgiven destroys the power of sin in your life. I know that this revelation has changed me and transformed my life. Jesus himself said that those who are forgiven much will love him much. Those who are forgiven little actually don't exist since all of us have been forgiven much. Or perhaps I should say those who think that they have been forgiven little will love him only a little. Remember the woman in the Bible who took the alabaster flask of fragrant oil and anointed Jesus' feet? Well, Jesus said to Simon, who was the Pharisee, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she, was, she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is given, forgiven, the same loves little. Now, the more that you realize that you have been forgiven much, actually, of all your sins, the more you will love the Lord Jesus. Forgiveness does not lead to a lifestyle of sin, my friends. It leads to a lifestyle of glorifying the Lord Jesus. So what do you think the woman's response would have been after she had departed from Jesus? Would she have desired to continue living a life of sin? Or would she, knowing that she has been forgiven much by God's grace, be strengthened to live a life that honored and glorified Jesus? Well, all of us have broken some of the Ten Commandments many times over. After all, if you break one, you fail in all. And if we haven't done so in action, then we have done so in our hearts and minds. Jesus said that if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you have committed murder. And if you look at a woman in lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. That goes both ways for ladies with men, too. So all of us have been forgiven much, and there is no reason for us not to love Jesus, our Lord and Savior. A lot. Much. Tons. The only reason people don't love him much is that they don't understand just how much they have been forgiven. They're like Simon, the Pharisee, who was confident in his self-righteousness. I mean, let's, let's be real. We start weighing out and measuring uh, the degrees of sin. We think that adultery and, mur and murder are, don't even equate. Adultery is a lot far lesser sin than murder. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Sin is sin in God's eyes, and it doesn't matter if it's a lie 
and what we would call a white lie, something that we were trying to fib about so that they wouldn't get their feelings hurt. That's a lie. A lie is a lie. It wouldn't matter if that was a lie like that or you had butchered somebody. In God's eyes, it's all sin. It's even. Okay? Now, a lot of preachers are telling believers that they have to, to exhibit more Christian character, more self-control, more godliness, and more brotherly kindness. Well, surprise! I totally agree that all these qualities are good and necessary. But my question to you is this. How do we develop them? How should we preachers help believers to exhibit more Christian character? Well, most would say discipline. We need to focus more on, on the Ten Commandments and develop discipline and self-control. Godliness and then brotherly love and kindness will come. And while all of that sounds very good to the flesh, that is not what the Word of God says. And I, for one, want to go by what God's Word says. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-9. through 9. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So it's clear that if a person lacks good Christian qualities like self-control, godliness, brotherly kindness, it's not because he lacks discipline, but because he has forgotten the main clause of the new covenant. <laughs> well, it's true. He's forgotten that the blood of Jesus has purchased for him the forgiveness of all sins. Let me give you a little tip here. If you remind yourselves daily that you have been cleansed from all your sins, you will exhibit more and more of these Christian qualities. Your heart will overflow with self-control, godliness, perseverance, brotherly kindness, and love. Bow your heads for a second. Dear Father, I thank you for the cross of Jesus. I thank you that today, because of Jesus' blood, I have been forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future. Today you are merciful to my unrighteousness, and all my sins and lawless deeds you will remember no more. You see me as completely righteous, not because of what I have done, but because of Jesus. I am greatly blessed, highly favored, and deeply loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the secret behind every godly man and woman is their belief in the truth that they have been forgiven. You see, their godliness stems from a revelation of their forgiveness. They are believers who believe and honor God's word. And when God says that he is merciful and that he has forgiven all their sins, they take him at his word. All day long, they are, for, they are forgiveness conscious. You see... They see the blood of Jesus continually washing them, kind of like a waterfall. They see God in his mercy and grace. Because of their forgiveness consciousness, they experience victory over sin continually. So just how are you forgiven of your sins? Well, listen closely. <laughs> we don't have to confess our sins in order to be forgiven. We confess our sins because we are already forgiven. Now, when I say confess our sins, I'm talking about being open with God. I don't go before him begging for forgiveness. Why? Because I know that I've already been forgiven. I know that I can go to him freely. He is my God, my father, my Abba Father, my daddy, and I am his child, one of his people. Forgiveness is not dependent on what I do, but on what Jesus has done. So confession in the new covenant is just being honest about our failures and our humanity. It's the result of being forgiven and not something you do in order to be forgiven. You understand that? It's the result of being forgiven, of having been forgiven, and not something you do in order to be forgiven. Let me give you this illustration. When your child makes a mistake, do you forgive him only when he comes to you and says, I'm sorry? No, of course not. As loving parents, you have already forgiven your child. You don't forgive him because of his confession or what he does. But when he says, I'm sorry, you can tell him that you love him and have already forgiven him. In the same way, our loving father in heaven doesn't forgive us only after we've confessed our sins. Fellowship with him isn't broken because our forgiveness isn't contingent upon what we do. It's contingent upon the work of Jesus at the cross, and we don't confess our sins in order to be forgiven. We confess or speak openly to our gracious Father because we have already been forgiven. And we thank him for having forgiven us. Let me make this statement. Understanding this difference determines whether you experience heaven on earth or hell on earth. That's right. As a young Christian, I was taught that unless I confessed all my sins, I wouldn't be forgiven. I hope you can see that this type of teaching makes the forgiveness of sins man's responsibility instead of something that was dependent on what Jesus' blood had already accomplished. 
You know, this type of erroneous teaching is based on man's traditions and not the scriptures. I've introduced wrong thinking to you as a traditional thinking, that's what I call it, and this is an example of it. This type of teaching put me into severe bondage. I didn't understand why it didn't seem to bother other Christians, but it really bothered me. I was very sincere and wanted to be always right with God. I didn't want to have any sin that was not forgiven. I didn't want fellowship with God to be broken, so everywhere I went, I was continually confessing my sins. For example, if I went somewhere and interacted with other people and disagreed with their ideas, I voiced my opinion and then silently repented for having said anything at all. I would close my eyes and begin to enumerate my sins to God, asking for forgiveness. Eventually, I narrowed the confession time down to just before bed, but then I'd fall asleep during the recounting and had to add that to the next day's confession. You see the bondage that was created? Now, keep in mind that this was all taking place while I was thinking I had committed the unpardonable sin. So, I was confessing as much as I could, just to be safe. I took one, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9 to the limit, and it was driving me up a wall. I was totally confused. So what exactly does 1 John 1, 9 really say, and to whom was it written? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now people have taken this verse and built whole doctrine around it, when actually chapter 1 of 1 John was written to the Gnostics, who were unbelievers. John was saying to these unbelievers um, that if they confess their sins, God would be faithful and just to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. As for us, believers, the moment we received Jesus, all of our sins were forgiven. We are not to live from confession to confession, but from faith to faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. You have to understand that there are no two ways about it. If you believe that you have to confess your sins to be forgiven, then make sure you confess everything. Don't just confess the big sins, big in your own estimation. Make sure you include in your confession every time you were worried, every, every time you were fearful, doubted, thought badly, or judgmentally of another person. The Bible says that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. So don't just confess what is convenient for you. Make sure that you confess everything. If you really believe that you need to confess all your sins to be forgiven, do you know what you'll be doing? You'll be confessing your sins all the time. So if you're, um, then, so if you are, then um, how can you have courage before God? I mean, how can you enjoy liberty as a child of God? I speak from experience, my friends. I tried it, and it's impossible. You can't even enjoy time with God because you feel guilty for not confessing your sins so that you can be in His presence. So my advice to you is, let's not build a whole doctrine on one verse. If confession of sins is vital for your forgiveness, then the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, has done us a great injustice because he didn't mention it, not even once, in any of his letters to the church. When there were people in the Corinthian church living in sin, he didn't say, go and confess your sins. Instead, he reminded them of their righteousness, saying, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Now notice, in spite of their sins, Paul still considered them uh, temples of the Holy Spirit, and he reminded them of his truth, of this truth. You know, I struggled so much with all this that God spoke to me one evening as I was tr trying desperately to confess all I could remember that I had done that day in sin. And I just threw up my hands and finally, in total exasperation, said to God that I just couldn't remember them all. Sins of commission and sins of omission. I mean, if I omitted something, what was it? I couldn't remember them all. I was a mess. Then God spoke to my heart and he said, why not just say thank you that you forgive me for all the things I've done or said that th and thought or thought that did not glorify you? Oh my goodness, I was so grateful I immediately began doing that and the guilt and the shame left me immediately. I couldn't possibly remember all the sins I had committed. It was just not a doable thing. So God saw my struggle and helped me up and over it. Notice, too, that God told me to approach him in thanksgiving. That way he could hear my prayer. Okay, this is the assurance you have today. Now, this is actually where we left off last time. <laughs> the day you received Jesus Christ, you confessed all of your sins once and for all. What? That's right. You acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, and He is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All the unrighteousness of your entire life was cleansed at that point. 
John made it clear in 1 John 1, 7 that when it comes to the believer's people who walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them from all sins. Here's the scripture. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice that for us believers who walk in the light, it is not our confessions that cleanse us from all sin, but the blood of Jesus. Note this as well. This verse says, walk in the light and not walk according to the light. Walking in the light means walking in the realm of light which Christ's death has already translated us into. I'm going to say that again. Walking in the light means walking in the realm of light which Christ's death has already translated us into. Christians often misconstrue this to mean walking according to the light, thinking that darkness will decrease and light will increase if we try to stay in the light. But that is not what this verse is talking about. It's talking about us already being translated out of the realm of darkness into the realm of light. And one little word makes all the difference. When we understand this uh, in the verse, then we realize that even when we sin, we sin in the realm of light. So if we sin in the light, we are cleansed in the light, and we are kept in the light. The idea of us going into darkness when we sin is not from the Bible. Now, the Bible is also uh, t tremendously beautiful and so rich and full of treasures. Did you know that even the word cleanses in 1 John 1, 7 is really beautiful? In the Greek tense for the word cleanse denotes a present and continuous action, which means that from the moment you receive Christ, the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing you. It is as if you're under a waterfall of his forgiveness continually. Even when you fail, this waterfall never stops. It keeps on keeping on, cleansing you. Uh, and, and what's it cleansing you from? All of your sins and unrighteousness. Now, confessing your sins all the time will make you only more sin conscious. But knowing that you're under Jesus' waterfall of forgiveness will keep you you forgiveness conscious knowing that you are forgiven of all your sins will give you the power to reign over every destructive habit and live a life of victory my friends in first john 2 verse 1 john addresses the believers as my little children he never addresses the unbelievers whom he was writing to in chapter 1 as my little children and he went on to say these things i write to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins we have an advocate with the father jesus christ Okay, pay close attention here. Notice that John did not tell the believers if anyone sins. Make sure he confesses his sins. No, his solution for a believer that sins is to point him to the finished work of Jesus. Jesus is our advocate before the Father, God, and it's because of his blood that we have forgiveness of all of our sins. So it's time to stop being robbed by traditional teachings and thinking and to start enjoying the waterfall of his forgiveness, which perpetually cleanses us. It never stops. It keeps on cleansing us. You know that negative thought you had of me a minute ago? <laughs> well, that has been cleansed too. Now let me tell you a short story about a little boy who used to play in the woods just a short distance away from a dilapidated shack that he lived in. His parents were too poor to buy him any toys, so he had to make do with whatever he could find to play with. Now one day he chanced upon a stone that was unlike any that he had ever seen before. The polished surface of the stone just glistened in his hands and winked at him each time he turned it around in the sunlight. It was his very own treasure, and he loved it. The boy didn't dare take it back to his home because there was nowhere in the shack that he could hide it. So he decided to dig a hole, a deep one, under some bushes and hide his precious possession there. The next day the boy couldn't wait to retrieve his stone and he ran it and ran to its hiding place as soon as the sun rose in the sky. But when his fingers finally found the stone in the muddy hideaway, it was all grubby and stained without any luster that he loved so much. The boy took the stone to the stream and lovingly dipped it in, allowing the dirt to be washed away. Finally it was clean again and the boy's heart swelled with pride at his coveted find. All too soon, though, it was time to head home again, and he had to return the stone to its hiding place. Every day the boy would rush to the spot where he had hidden the stone, and every day he would find its shining surface was smeared with mud and gook, and he would trek to the stream quite a distance away and wash it. Now this happened for a while before he decided to solve the problem. That particular day, when it was almost time for him to head for home, the little boy took his stone to a small waterfall and wedged it lovingly between two rocks, right in the middle of the steady flow of the waterfall. 
That night the stone experienced a continual washing, and that little boy never had to wash the stone again. Every time that he retrieved it, it gleamed in his hands completely cleansed. Now, what that little boy did initially with the stone can be likened to what happens under the Old Covenant. Each time you sinned, you had to be cleansed, but before you knew it, you would sin again and you would have to take uh, your sin offering of either a bullock or a lamb to the priest to be cleansed again. Some believers still think that this is our covenant today. And let me declare to you that the, the blood of Jesus is far greater than the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, brought um, us eternal forgiveness. The blood of Jesus... Uh, the, I'm sorry, the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Covenant could only offer temporary forgiveness. And that's why the children of Israel had to keep taking animal sacrifices to the priests over and over and over again every time they failed. Jesus, however, died on the cross once and once only and for all. When you were born again, you became a living stone and God placed you right under the waterfall of his son's blood. Hence, every thought that you have that is amiss, every feeling that is not right, every action that's not correct, is washed away. You are always kept clean and forgiven because of the continuous cleansing blood of Jesus. Now, it's important in the study of grace to understand the partaking of Holy Communion. I spend quite a bit of time on this as a standalone subject. However, today I will tie it to grace in order to give you a more complete understanding. Let's take a minute and delve into the Word of God so that we can examine and understand this truth. And let's read what Paul actually said about partaking of Holy Communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 27 through 30. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of Christ, or of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. You know, down through the years, the body of Christ has mistakenly believed that to partake of Holy Communion in an unworthy manner is to partake with sin in your life. Therefore, we're told not to partake of, the Holy, of Holy Communion when we deem ourselves not right with God. Otherwise, we may become weak, sickly, and die before our time. All right, now let me tell you this right here. We have managed to turn what was meant to be a blessing into a curse. This mistaken belief has not a, one shred of biblical uh, uh, stature. To partake unworthily does not refer to you partaking as an unworthy person because of your sins. The Lord revealed this truth to me, and in the process of teaching me this, he said to me, Remember Jesus died for unworthy people. What the verse really offers to, to us is the manner in which you partake. To partake unworthily is to fail to discern that the bread which you hold in your hands is the body of Jesus Christ. That was beaten for you, so that your body could be healed and made whole and well. This is what was happening in the early church. There were believers who were just eating the bread because they were hungry, and some hadn't eaten breakfast that morning, and others were taking the bread as a ritual without discerning the Lord's body and releasing faith. Therefore, to partake in an unworthy manner is not about your failing to examine yourself and con confess all your sins to make sure you're worthy to partake. No, not at all. It's not about the one partaking. It's about the fact or manner in which one partakes. It is, it, it's about discerning the Lord's body and releasing faith to see the bread as his body, beaten and striped for your healing. It's about seeing that, uh, that wafer, that bread crust, or even crumb, as Jesus' body, full of his healing and divine health and vibrancy of life, that divine supernatural wholeness coming to the inside of your body, pushing out all darkness, which is sickness, disease, and symptoms that tried to get you to take. All right? Healing you from the inside out, filling your body with the Sakina glory, illuminating your, you with the glory of God, totally healed, totally well, and totally restored to divine health and wellness. Living and having your existence... Um, in divine health, just as you were created to be, invincible. Now, it's about seeing the wine as the blood, and that was shed for your forgiveness and shed for the forgiveness of all your sins, all right, for all people. Now, therein is the secret to God's divine health and wholeness. Many fail to discern the body of Jesus and see for themselves how he suffered in his body on their behalf. This is the reason many are sick and weak. So it's not about looking at yourself and confessing your sins. It's about 
looking to Jesus and seeing what he's accomplished on the cross for you. All you really need to know is that you are being constantly cleansed of all your sins. And once you believe that all of your sins are completely forgiven, past, present, and future, I should say past, current, and future, <laughs> and that God doesn't hold uh, anything against you, faith will spring forth. Faith will be there for healing, prosperity, and restoration. The continuous washing of the blood qualifies you for any miracle that you need in your life right now or any upcoming in the future. Now, I'm going to stop here because I'm out of time. And, oh golly, am I ever. And then we'll pick it up here on uh, tomorrow. Let me just make sure that I mark it so that I can pick it back up there. Well, I didn't do it. All right, this should do it. Just a minute, folks. I have to put my glasses on so I can see. Okay. Now, what I want to say to you is this. I hope you got something out of this so far. And we'll, like I say, continue it tomorrow. But I want you to remember this. That Proverbs 4.7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing, and therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Keep Jesus Lord of your life, my friends. And know that the Master's Touch Masterclass is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. God bless you until tomorrow, and we'll pick it up there. And I will be uh, teaching you once again. <laughs> so, blessings. Mm -hmm.